Welcome back to the class on international business communication. Today we will uh, start wrapping up the set of classes. We have uh, discussed various things in these lectures. We have discussed what it means. Can you please restart? There's somebody shouting outside. Welcome back to the class on international business communication. Uh, we have done a lot of different things. We have uh, discussed what communication means, how it is different in different settings. We have discussed um, how to be persuasive. We have discussed so many, uh, you know, how conflict happens, um, how leaders communicate. All of those things have been discussed in this class. Today, we are going to discuss what, uh, uh, how to apply whatever we have learnt in written communication. We have been discussing about communication as a whole and specifically oral communication. We have discussed um, non-verbal communication also, but today we will focus exclusively on written communication. And uh, before we begin, I must tell you that I have consciously tried to avoid the prescriptive approach. Uh, no teacher, no mentor, Nobody can give you formulae for the entire gamut of experiences you will come across in your entire lives as professionals or even otherwise. And uh, what typically we tend to do, we meaning even I have done this in our courses is to give students tips, you know, uh, 15, steps to, uh, 15 steps to effective uh, negotiation or uh, uh, 10 steps to effective presentations or this or that. Through this course, I am doing slightly something slightly different and this is what I have been trying out in my classes also. On occasion, I have to give tips, but I would like you to take whatever you learn from these classes and come up with your own prescriptions yourselves. I am giving you the reasons for how things happen. I am giving you the reasons for why things happen the way they do. Now, I would like you to take all the learning from these classes, take the keywords, explore some more, learn more things on your own and develop your own prescriptions for doing the things the way you need to do them because things are changing so fast, the society is changing so fast, the business environment is changing so fast that you need to change, uh, you need to adapt really, really fast and you need to be able to think on your toes and how can you do that? If you have these categories in your minds, if you know how things work, which category this goes into, you can design your own specific ways of doing things. But uh, if you don't know the background behind of these things, if you don't know the reasons why these things happen, then you cannot come up with these prescriptions yourselves and you will keep hunting around and you will say, I have these 15 prescriptions. But this is a 16th type of situation and that is something that is specific, you know, that, that I am trying to avoid specifically. That is why um, I teach a whole course on written communication in uh, uh, IIT Kharagpur. It is a semester long course and uh, that is what made designing this lecture very, very difficult. I thought that instead of giving you, you know, formats for memos and cover letters and this and that, I will discuss the specific issues. Uh, for written communication in business, especially in international business and uh, getting all that together and coming up and summing up a 30 hour course into one hour class was the most difficult task, but we will see. But everything I am saying here is only suggestive and uh, none of whatever I say here is exhaustive. There is always, there are always going to be things that you can add on to whatever I am telling you. Just take these as leads and go from there. Now we will not, um, uh, we will not really have any time for revisions today. But what I would like you to do uh, is just listen to what I am saying. And I have a couple of exercises that are woven into the fabric of the course. And when you come across those exercises, see if you can um, uh, do them. You can pause the video and do those exercises as and when they come up. And that is how this class is, is different from the rest of the classes. Okay, so let us move on to written communication. Why writing? What is the purpose of writing? Why do you need to write? You need to write 
because uh, and again you know I have put in this question right at the end also but at this time I would really like you to have a discussion on how written communication is different from oral communication and what does verbal communication mean. We had talked about this right in the beginning, verbal communication has something to do with words. It is communication through words that are symbols for things that we, uh, uh, for concepts that we learn from our environment. And uh, so, written communication technically is verbal, it is not oral. Oral communication involves the use of our vocal cords, but written communication is uh, verbal technically, it uses words, it uses these signs and uh, why do we need to write in international business? The reasons are, it leaves a record. There is a, there is a record, you can go back to it, you can refer to it it has the archival value attached to it. Uh, you can put in as much detail as possible, you can add whatever you want, you can include a lot of information that people can take their own time to read. So, it is not time sensitive, uh, it serves as documentation or proof, again uh, legally it can be used uh, as documentation, as proof, as evidence and uh, you have proof that something had been said and the manner in which it had been said and promised and uh, so on and so forth. It uh, is an aid to memory because you have a record, there is you know it aids your memory, you can always go back to it, it reminds you of whatever happened and how things happened and, and you can go back to it, you revisit it as opposed to oral communication where once things are said, uh, of course, what we are doing here is a record of oral communication. You are listening to me speak and I have tried to put as much information as possible on the slides and there will be a web course uh, supporting this also. But uh, even then, the mannerisms I use, the tones I use cannot be replicated. They can be recorded of course through audiovisual media, but then you know that serves as an aid to memory. It uh, writing helps you reconstruct past events again because of the detail, because of the context, it sort of you know uh, stimulates certain memory traces in your mind and it helps you uh, reconstruct, it helps you revisit past events, um, it helps in the establishment of knowledge, notice or intent of the organization or individual at a relevant time. If you know when the document was created, you read the document, you read the supporting detail and it helps you construct the context at that time. It helps you revisit the context. That is not possible even through oral communication, even through a video recording of the oral communication. So, uh, writing with all the detail and all the words and, and you know you make notes over there and, and so everything you know provided uh, depending on how much detail you put into your written document, you can more or less uh, remember the what was said and in which context were, were the things uh, discussed uh, and, and uh, shared with whoever they were shared with. So that is, there, these are again not an exhaustive list. These are some of the reasons why writing is important in business. Okay, uh, some limitations, uh, there is no opportunity for feedback. There is no opportunity for feedback, you cannot uh, 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 structure the next bit of your message uh, based on what, how the receiver of the message responds. So, you have to uh, construct the whole message in one shot and send it across. And uh, you have to, there is no opportunity, when there is no feedback, there is no opportunity for revisions or explanations. I mean, whatever you say goes as one package and uh, you can only hope that it will be interpreted in the right context and there is no opportunity for supplemental non-verbal communication. You cannot like, you know, I am saying something, now I say there is no opportunity for supplemental non-verbal communication. I could, my, I could write it down. But when I say it, I move my hands and I say non-verbal communication, I am emphasizing on certain points. So, uh, you can't uh, really add all of these things. Now, one bridge between all of these is the smileys we use these days in digital communication. We will talk about technology and business communication in the following lecture. But uh, today, all I am trying to tell you is that, that even then, the hum human emotions that go along with any 
message that is transmitted orally are uh, not possible in uh, messages that are transmitted in the written form. And these are some of the limitations of written messages. Again, add to the list. I leave it to you. You can expand the list as much as possible. Okay. Communication styles, we had discussed this at some point. Uh, we talked about the flowery or oratorical style where you use lots of adjectives and this is appropriate for festive occasions, celebrations and honorary ceremonies. Uh, you have the plain and straightforward style which is earnest and artless used by competent business and professional people, clear cut. So, uh, you know, if for example, I will give you an example of these two things. Now, if somebody is entering this room, for example, this is a studio and uh, let us assume that and there are chairs in front and let us assume that somebody uh, maybe the director of the institute is entering and there is a group of students sitting there. So, if I were to use the flowery or oratorical style, I would say uh, our eminent director uh, is entering the classroom, please stand up and welcome him and you know I add uh, these very uh, appropriate adjectives to whatever I am saying. When I say plain straightforward, he is still outside and I just walk in and say the director is about to come. Please be seated, please switch off your cell phones. And so, you know once he enters then the style with which I say things changes. The same thing happens in written communication. We use lots of uh, adjectives to magnify the situation in the, orator in the flowery or oratorical style. This is the kind of style that is used in novels to describe um, events and situations and people and emotions and all of that good stuff. Uh, when we come to plain and straightforward, this is the, the thing that, that you need to learn. Uh, people in business do not have time to read long documents. So, it is plain and straightforward and to the point short crisp sentences with words that do not need to be looked up in dictionaries. So, that is pretty much what this is. Indirect or opaque is perfect for cover ups or to leave some uh, way out. So, maybe uh, in my opinion all of those things are that you use you know you use these things to sort of uh, leave room for many more interpretations than the ones that you have intended. And it is perfect for cover ups or where you are not sure it just sort of helps you with a way out. Uh, Personalizing or humanizing used to stir up readers and arouse interest in action. Again, um, when you become, uh, you use emotional words, you appeal to the human emotions of people who are reading, uh, you sort of add these words to add volume to whatever you are saying. Stilted or redundant, overly formal, pompous, wordy, they have a numbing or draining effect. Uh, again, I will share a secret with you. I'm, I know now it is going to be up on YouTube, but uh, it is okay. Uh, this is the style we use in classes uh, when uh, we really want the students to pay attention and I will give you these big words that I understand that I am sure you do not. And so, I will throw these big massive words at you and that will just numb your senses and hopefully some of you will be impressed and you will say my god she knows so much. And uh, or if I want you to pay attention, I'll give you these big words, and you're left wondering as to what they mean. And so you take time off your distractions, and you start focusing on what I'm telling you. And then I just say, okay, I'm going to maybe ask you for definitions of these words in the examination. And suddenly everybody is, you know, tuned to what the teacher is saying. And then I come back to simplistically explaining everything. So this is something that you do. You use big words for. Uh, to drain or to, to sort of get the other person to listen to you, to pay attention to you and to sort of uh, think that you know too much. Uh, winding or val uh, voluminous style is what I like to call the Jalebi style. Now, Jalebi in, um, I was just told that this is going to be broadcast to parts uh, other than India also. So, I will tell you Jalebi is a sweet meat, an Indian sweet meat. It is very delicious. It is just round shaped and you can just look up in uh, um, uh, do a web search on jalebi and it's delicious if you can go to an indian store and have it nothing like it but it's 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 this kind of style that where we sort of beat about the bush to encourage more ideas more um, uh, uh, discussion of more aspects of a situation and all these styles can be used in business 
uh, you know in some situations one style would be appropriate in other situations another style would be appropriate but it's excellent this this winding or voluminous style is excellent for idea generation and again this is uh, what we sometimes get uh, in examination papers when students come to the examination unprepared and they keep writing pages and pages and pages and uh, we as examiners are uh, uh, supposed to sort of go through five pages of, of uh, writing and find out what the student is trying to say to award them say maybe five marks out of ten and uh, this is pretty much what happens but this is something that can be used very positively for generation of ideas. Uh, I will give you an exercise now. Uh, please pause the slides and pause the video and uh, do this exercise and then I will tell you how it uh, relates to your work. Okay. Uh, try writing a paragraph about each of the following situations. So, the first one would be a speech at your best friend's wedding. Uh, the second would be a request to the accounts office seeking clarification regarding your scholarship disbursement. The third one would be defending yourself when you have been caught doing something wrong. The fourth paragraph would be consoling a friend who has recently lost a loved one. Fifth would be negative feedback to a subordinate who is older than you and insists on treating you like a child at work and uh, you go to the subordinate uh, and the subordinate says you can't tell me how to do my job. Are you trying to tell me how to do my job? I have been working here since your father studied in this university or since your father worked in this office. So, are you trying to teach me how to manage these things? Who do you think you are? You are still a kid. If you have to give negative feedback to such a subordinate, what would you write? What would you say? So, just draft a paragraph on that and uh, maybe write a paragraph on the relationship between religion and quantum physics. Random. I do not know uh, very much about either of them. I know very little bit. If there are experts, I am sure they can come up with something, but my guess is that uh, many people may not really have an idea of how these two are connected. Now, the exercise here is that please write these paragraphs and try and gauge the differences between how you write these paragraphs. If you do not see very much difference in how you write each of these paragraphs, then there is a problem. Then there is a real problem and you must see a visible difference between the style that you adopt for writing each of these things and I will give you a hint. When you write the speech at your best friend's wedding, you will use a lot of positive adjectives to describe whatever is going on and uh, sort of uh, elate the whole situation. <clears throat> the second one is uh, when you write a request to the accounts office seeking clarification regarding a scholarship disbursement, it has to be a plain straightforward style where you put the facts down and all you do is uh, where you put the facts down and you all you do is uh, uh, just plain straightforwardly ask the accounts office what is going on. This is what I did. Please tell me what is going on. Defending yourself when you have been doing uh, when you have been caught doing something wrong. Again, we would prefer you know ideally you should be very factual, but what we tend to do is sort of cover up things and we tend to sort of leave a room uh, way out for or give them interpretations that make sense to us, defend our position also and uh, sort of leave ambiguity. So, this would be the opaque style. Consoling a friend, this would be the humanizing style and you should be able to see visible differences. Negative feedback to a subordinate, here redundant, maybe you quote policies and procedures. Uh, relationship between religion and quantum physics go wild with imagination. Be as creative as you want and you should be able to arrive at something. So, you know try this and this will give you an idea of what you have a what you tend to do when you write any document. Saying things is different, but many of us have a problem when we start writing things. Okay. <clears throat> Some factors affecting um, the effectiveness of written communication in international business. Um, the challenges, I am sorry. Um, uh, some common problems with written communication. The first one is the written communication could be too long or wordy. Uh, can we please pause for a second? Please. I am sorry, some slides need to be reorganized. Just two minutes. Okay. okay uh, once you have discovered your 
writing style, you have gauged the differences and you have seen visible differences after a lot of practice, uh, then move on to the next part. Uh, now, these differences should be visible to you, these differences uh, should be should really strike stand out and once you can see these differences that means you have got the hang of how to write differently in different situations. Again, this is the starting point, writing requires a lot of practice, you keep going back and forth and you keep revising things and that is how you learn to write well. Uh, and okay. Uh, some common problems with written business communication, again various types of research um, have been done, lots of people have uh, studied this, I looked at one paper, I am sure this list can be much longer than it is right now. Most people complain that the written communication of business professionals tends to be too long and wordy, especially when they join business organizations. It tends to be very, very wordy, they do not know when to stop, they just keep adding too much detail. Uh, it is poorly organized, the, the portions are not really well juxtaposed with each other. Um, it is confusing, clarity is missing, coherence is missing, uh, it is incomplete. Many times uh, there is uh, inaccurate information or there is not enough information to reach a point where people can actually arrive at the same conclusions that you did from different situations or uh, many times it has too much data. One is it is long and wordy, you just keep going on and on and on beat about the bush and just keep repeating the same thing or you tend to put in so many so much data that it becomes to it becomes so difficult to weed out the sense making data from the uh, uh, the nonsense data from the sense making data and uh, many times it has no clear purpose the focus is missing and uh, many times people tend to use uh, trite and overused and archaic expressions or they tend to just repeat themselves and and uh, use these meaningless expressions and phrases uh, some specific challenges to written communication in international business. The first one here is the language to be used, what we get confused about. When we, we talk about written communication, I am telling you what the problems are and you say I am going on an international visit and uh, uh, you know I am going to face these problems. The first one is language to be used, which language should we be using and why? You will say English, why English? If you are going to go to a, uh, say if you are going to go and join a company in say Germany or Italy and uh, you are going to be selling tractors and uh, uh, these multi-processing machines uh, to, to people in the fields or, or the, the machines that are going to be used by people uh, on the farms, uh, would you need to use English? Do you think English is going to be helpful? Why? Then you will say, okay, if I am going to Germany, I learn German. Will you really become bilingual? Will you really be able to uh, grasp everything? It is a good start. Yes, you will listen to some things and you will catch on to some things and but unless you have lived in that country, unless you have lived in that place, unless you have been immersed in that culture, will you be able to uh, figure out the interpretations of the, the different words that I used? And so, you know, this becomes a problem, which language should I use, when should I use this language, why should I use this language, it is okay if you are working in a multinational corporation where everybody speaks English, then English definitely. But then, uh, you know, you have to be bilingual if English is not your uh, mother tongue. So, uh, bilingualism or multilingualism becomes a problem and again, unless you have been immersed in a language since your childhood you cannot be truly bi or multilingual, you are sort of partially bilingual or multilingual. Uh, native readers versus non-native readers, again how you correspond with native readers will be different from how you correspond with non-native readers. Um, we are talking about Indians going abroad, what about the people from abroad who come to India? Uh, they maybe they come and settle down in Gujarat and they are trying to uh, deal with these uh, cloth merchants in Gujarat and uh, they want to go to the village and they want to deal with them and they try and learn Gujarati and they will try and speak Gujarati also and they may even learn to write Gujarati but do you think they are going to pick up or they are going to be able to pick up the nuances of the language so easily and so fast? So, you know you have this acculturation phase and we will talk about that uh, when we discuss uh, expatriation, impatriation, etc. 
but all these things create a problem when you are writing things because you can you cannot explain things mm -hmm. as well as you would be able to when you are speaking them um, translation versus interpretation what did you say versus what did you mean translation can happen if you get a grasp of the language you can translate documents but the intended meaning and the interpreted meaning will be very far away from each other unless clarity is there in the written documents so uh, staying in india like i just told you i talked about jalebi style now people who've had jalebis uh, which comprises a large section of indians will know what i'm talking about and they'll say yeah you just go round and round and round but somebody who's never had a jalebi he will say one they will not know how to pronounce the word secondly they'll be like what is this you know why use a jalebi why not something else you know somebody will say okay why jalebi why not murku or something else you know some i mean if it's if it has to be a food item or you'll say a spiral or whatever so what do you really mean when you say translation uh, when you say interpretation what did you mean and that has to come in and through writing and that has to come through the clarity in writing and so that becomes a problem when you're trying to communicate in the language of a business uh, that happens to be in a place where uh, people don't speak the language that you grew up with english again big topic is english really the language of international communication it has slowly come up but uh, you know when i was growing up we were told that uh, uh, the most commonly language uh, used language uh, in the world is spanish and then followed by french and then english was number 3 or number 4 but nowadays because of the internet i again i don't have the statistics i've tried to look for them and people say different things but it is slowly gaining popularity maybe it is the language of international communication but again it is one of the languages depending on what business you're doing and where and you may need to learn different scripts you may need to learn different things but for the purpose of this class i'm going to stick with english at least for this lecture uh, it is perceived as the language of formal communication there was a research done in malaysia where uh, the researcher um, asked the students to respond to something and she didn't specify what uh, language they were supposed to use and by default they they uh, assumed that this was a formal document and they responded in malay and uh, then uh, she gave them a choice and then she said that uh, uh you know you can either you can respond in a language of your choice and when they responded in uh, uh sorry when when she didn't give them a choice they responded in english when they when she gave them a choice they responded in malay and uh, the the uh, effectiveness was much higher when they responded in their native language and uh, so you know we just perceive we assume that the language that we are supposed to use in formal situations is going to be english So since that assumption is there we'll just go with that assumption but there's lots and lots of research going on it's the new term that has come up is belf b e l f business english as lingua franca so you might want to look it up and see what people are saying about it uh since english is being used i will address some issues specific to english and since this program is being recorded in india i'm going to uh, explain to you the context here now for indians i'm sure uh, the indians who are listening to this will agree with me that in india english uh, most people use english uh, and a uh, second language or english as a second language or their own regional mother tongue english hindi and a third language which is their mother tongue so they grow up as native speakers of a specific language and they learn hindi in school and they learn english in school and so most indians most educated indians are trilingual they at least follow english and hindi and their own uh, native regional languages and with such diversity english becomes a second or a third language for them and many times that can create problems with the usage of the language english is a foreign language for most indians and uh, when i say foreign language again i'm not talking about the educated elite i'm talking about the commoners it is still a second or a th third language and we need to acknowledge that fact and there is no shame in admitting one's limitations with this foreign language when we say foreign language we shouldn't be ashamed to say that yes i'm not comfortable with the grammar i'm not comfortable with uh, the uh, manner in which things are written and uh, since 
the people listening i'm assuming that the people listening to this uh, series of lectures is uh, are planning to compete with the best nationally and internationally uh, i would encourage you to diagnose your uh, uh, limitations and uh, acknowledge them and and work on uh, resolving them and work towards overcoming them and uh, i can suggest some resources please pause please read these resources and uh, these are some of the resources i came across if you have more you can keep adding to this list but i have compiled a small list of resources that can help you become more comfortable with english as a foreign language again not exhaustive so you can go through these resources the the website addresses are there and i hope they'll be still working by the time this is put up and you can access them and these are good resources that can help you get a, a stronger grasp on the language so please become comfortable um in whichever language you intend to use for your international business transactions and i'm not going to give you any formula uh, you need to do that yourself okay uh we'll continue with the specific challenges um in, in addition to the language being used the interpretation of a foreign language uh is another challenge how do you interpret the foreign language how do you interpret and in india it it is also a different regional language for example this program is being recorded in bengal the people who are recording this program who are in the back end of this you know who are busy recording who are busy editing uh proficient in english and hindi they do their best to communicate as clearly as possible with us very very hard working lot but if they were but they feel much more comfortable conversing in bengali now if they are teamed up with say people from gujarat and tamil nadu and himachal pradesh uh i'm sure many of them would feel uncomfortable discussing as many things not uncomfortable but somehow limited also uh again depends on how strongly rooted you are to your native language and how how comfortable you feel using other language so for these people hindi is a second language and english is a third language and and they are multilingual and they many of them speak odia also in addition to bengali and so you know they i mean simple people who are helping us and so uh, which language do they use with whom so the first reaction is when they see a faculty member just to be to make the faculty member comfortable they start with bengali and then you say okay i'm sorry i don't understand bengali immediately they switch to english or hindi so they've been adapted to it but if they move to a different place where people are more comfortable using a different language within india with writing also which language would they use and why and how would they interpret these 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 subtleties in the different language when i say foreign language i'm also talking about the different regional languages that exist in a diverse country like india so does training help maybe with translation uh not very much with interpretation unless you immerse yourself in that region and you are sort of using only that language to speak and to think also that takes time and that takes practice uh review and revisitation of recorded written invitation um, information provides opportunities for multiple interpretations wherever possible it can be good it can be bad good because it helps you clarify things bad because uh you come up with so many different interpretations you don't know which one really fits best so that is another challenge to uh written communication in international business what did this person mean since there is no active feedback the channel you use for uh transmitting the written in, um, information or written message um again can be suspect um if it's just paper and pencil it's different if it's electronic media how people perceive the media how they they react to the medium um how they uh, uh, use the medium will be different uh, vary from place to place country to country depending on their access to such media the strategy and design of messages again um uh, how do you design the message what comes first what comes next how do you address people uh, how do you construct your message how do you choose the channel how do you uh, what content do you include how much do you include what you leave out all of those those things are some of the challenges to uh, written communication in international business and now we come to the big one which is culture and subcultural diversity my god huge huge challenge uh, starts with formatting of documents salutation closing 
signatures, date, margins, page numbers, what do you put, where you put it, how do you address people, where do you start because when you are talking to people you can hear others. So, you know somebody meets you in an international setting and they say Mr. So and so, Ms. So and so, Dr. So and so, Professor So and so and you know that is the, the form of address that is used but what if you are writing to somebody outside of the country and you, you don't know what they will like, there is no feedback so you have to really be very very cautious and you get confused. How do you write the date? I will come to that in a little bit, I will show you some examples of this. Strategy for designing and interpreting messages again depends on the culture and when we say subcultural diversity again within a culture, uh, when two people get together they form a different culture of their own in and through interaction amongst themselves and that is the, the diversity. So, within India, within this group here uh, in the studios, we have faculty who are a professionally different group than the staff who are a professionally different group than the research scholars, the PhD students who are helping both people who are different from the M Tech students, the masters in technology students who are different from the, uh, the helpers and the attendants in the office. So, there are five professional groups. When we come to cultural diversity, we have uh, people from different states within India using different languages. When we come to educational diversity, we have people with uh, more hands on experience and we have pure academics like me who have spent a lot of their time studying and teaching but have not had very much experience in the industry. I have had some but maximum is here. So, you know and there are many people like me in academics. So, you know all these diversities sort of you know we, we cling on to people who are similar to us. Somebody who speaks the same mother tongue as me, somebody who uses the same kind of nuances in his or her language like me, maybe gender. I sort of you know go and have tea with some ladies here. Uh, again, you know I prefer to correspond with women because I think they will understand me better and again these sort of not really I mean this is not conscious many times it is subconscious, but this is subcultural diversity. Appropriateness of words, style, length, all of these things again which words do you use, what style of writing do you use, how long the message should be again depends on the culture, tone direct or indirect, diplomacy and courtesy again you know uh, how do you address people, what will sound polite, what will sound diplomatic, what will sound abrupt, what will sound brash again depends on your perception of that culture and that is very difficult to gauge especially in written communication. Communication networks, shape of the network, who talks to whom and why, the size of the networks, vertical versus horizontal networks, you know who do you report to, how does the message need to be sent. So, if I need to send a note to the director, it has to be through my head of department, through somebody else, some nodal officer in the central administration central administration to the director. And so, that chain of command has to be followed and there are reasons for this. Things have to be filed, things have to be copied, things need to be, you know, records need to be kept, people need to know, people need to give permissions, but again depends on the structure of the organization. Gender issues, preference for dealing with men versus women. Who do you prefer to deal with? In some cultures, men prefer to deal with men, especially where written communication or even oral communication is concerned. They feel uncomfortable dealing with women. In other cultures, again, and similarly, you know, women will feel more comfortable dealing with women. And in other cultures, it's neutral. I don't care who's on the other side. As long as the tone is the same, I really don't care who's responding to my message. So, but it can be an issue. Transactional culture is the new culture or context that is created in and through interactions between people from different cultures. Uh, native to native, very little bit, not, not a very, the transactional culture is not very different. It is just these some specific rules that come up because of the interaction. Uh, native to non-native, again, you know, somebody coming into India from outside, we will be interacting differently with them. Uh, two Indians living in a different country will be interacting with each other in a different manner than they will be interacting with the local uh, people over there. And again, you know, they may discuss their own limitations, they may expect the other person to understand their limitations. And again, when it comes to writing, the challenge is where do I draw the line? How much, how, what do I put in, what do I take out? And these things vary uh, according to the, the transactional culture that is created within an organization, extremely complicated. My whole, my goal here, you know, if I have if I've, uh, succeeded in confusing you, uh, I have done my job today. So, 
I'm just trying to sensitize you to all these different things that are happening in your environment and that is why drafting a message becomes very, very difficult. Now, uh, my suggestions at this point are, uh, I'll tell you what I prefer to do. Uh, in these situations, when I say format of documents, again, I prefer that I prefer to use a uh, very, very uh, neutral form of salutation and and address and just follow the, the tone of the organization be as formal as possible and then bring it down to less formal depending on the feedback you get from the other person and usually very few people get offended by that. That's my suggestion to you again decide your own strategy for dealing with these things according to your own organization. Some factors affecting effectiveness of uh, written communication in international business. Uh, all the challenges that were discussed in the previous slide plus the perceptions regarding the quantity, quality, timeliness and cost of the um, interaction. Again, these inputs are from a, a, a doctoral dissertation by um, submitted by Dr. Roach in 2006. You can look it up, the list, it will be in the list of references. You are welcome to find the dissertation and read it and very interesting, you know, how she's um, uh, described the effect of uh, 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 quantity of written communication, the quality of written communication, the timeliness, when do you send the communication, how long do you take before you respond, all of those things are and, and the costs, uh, the opportunity costs and other costs involved in drafting the written communication. Perceived credibility is another one, um, how credible do you perceive the written communication to be? Uh, is another uh, factor, you know, if you perceive it to be credible, some coming from the top, coming from an expert, more credible. And then again, you are worried about how your communication will be perceived by the other party. And so you have to draft it appropriately, which is why I keep putting in all these brackets and names and all this research. I want you to think that I've really done uh, my job in drafting this course properly. So, you know, I want to be as thorough as possible and I want to convey that to you. So I've got all these brackets afterwards. Um, as you can see in the previous slide, um, all these people who have said different things. Anyway, uh, and perceived meaning is another one that can affect the effectiveness of written communication. I will give you an example of some outdated phrases. This is slight entertainment, enjoy. Um, we use these words quite a bit. Yours truly, very truly, yours obediently, uh, honored, honorable so and so. Again, um, you know, these words may have meant something, but they convey a very different, uh, they have a very different connotation in, in written communication as technology is advancing, as the society is evolving and again, they are considered to be outdated. Please be advised, again, you know, that's another ambiguous one, outdated one, uh, use these with care. That's my only suggestion to you. Kindly, why not please is another suggestion that was given by Blake in 2001 in his paper. So, uh, please do not hesitate to contact me, please do not hesitate to forward this, please do not hesitate to get back to me. Um, I have forwarded something to you instead of saying I have sent, you say I have forwarded. We use these inflated phrases, please note that, you know, so why please note? You just say something and if the person think, thinks it is noteworthy, they will make a note of it. Uh, enclosed, please find. Under separate cover is another one, contact the undersigned, why don't you say contact me, contact the undersigned. Uh, with due respect, I beg to state, this is my favorite one. Uh, why do I beg? I don't want to beg you, I beg to state why. With due respect, yes, I will draft the message in such a way that it comes across as respectful. Uh, so, you know, why do I need to reiterate that? But again, we use these expressions in some uh, places, please revert back not please revert, please revert back. That, this is something that I have seen very commonly in written, formal written communication. Enclosed here with, here to, here unto, all of those things are not really used very much now. For your kind perusal, again, uh, this is for your reference works just as well. Uh, please furnish me with details is another one. So, we have all of these different uh, uh, expressions that are no longer in use. Uh, but again, the perceived meaning can be very different in different situations. So, please use these things with care. Common sources of confusion in written communication dates. Do you write 30th of June 2030? Do you write June 30, 2030? 
डू यू राइट जीरो सिक्स थर्टी टू जीरो थ्री जीरो और थ्री जीरो जीरो सिक्स थ्री जीरो एट्सेट्रा आई मीन हाउ डू यू राइट द डेट प्रैक्टिकल कन्फ्यूजन अगेन डिपेंडिंग ऑन द प्लेस दैट यूर इन डिपेंडिंग ऑन हाउ दे राइट थिंग्स यू नीड टू राइट अकॉर्डिंग टू देम आई हैव नोटिस दिस that in uh, the united states specifically they write the month before the date and so if that is the the method being followed please follow that address and salutations again do you write dear or do you not write dear mr ms ms is pronounced as ms it is pronounced as m i z but written as ms uh, miss or mrs again please don't use miss or mrs unless you are absolutely sure of the person's marital status and uh, uh, again uh, please avoid this you know ms works just fine pronounced as ms uh, start with the professional title doctor professor professor engineer or the religious and or political title um, your holiness your um, royal highness etc your lordship um, all of these things work just as well but uh, please avoid using this and dear again use with care uh, the format which format do you use i can't tell you you have to figure this out based on the organization that you're in appropriateness of words uh, the appropriateness of words is another one sexist racist or uh, language or terms um, you know which language can be considered sexist or racist which language can be used uh, uh, considered or will be considered by the readers as neutral again has to be decided so he she um uh, and again these common slang words can be a problem uh jargon versus slang jargon is technical words that are used by a specific group of people uh, who know what these words mean so by all means use as much jargon as possible for internal communications even for external communication if you know that the reader knows what you're talking about but otherwise try and avoid the use of these things slang um better to avoid it in in uh, formal communication as far as possible how do you end the communication please focus on the slide thank you uh, yours truly or faithfully or sincerely or obediently again uh, depending on where you are neutral things single formula yours faithfully or sincerely works well regards comma so and so works really well again very neutral uh, you're not really falling at somebody's feet but you're still being respectful that works well for me it may or may not for you uh, requests please or kindly or something else again thanking um, i'm grateful um, i'm i appreciate your help plus or minus more positive adjectives personal or impersonal i versus the third person this has been done or i have done this again depending on the situation but these are the main places where we tend to get confused okay an example of this a difference between a traditional us and a traditional business uh, mexican biz business letter you start in an american business letter um, you start with the main point of the letter get lots give lots of supporting information or explanation and then you tell the reader what to do next you know explain that but maximum portion is supporting portion or uh, information in a mexican business letter the establishment of rapo um, is a big part then you develop the background you deliver the news you develop the the rest of the letter you conclude by again establishing a rapport and again this is just an example for uh, uh, you to see you know how these letters are different i've given you the source at the end please go and check the source and you will get more information on how these two are different communicative purposes of written business messages this is really the crux of today's presentation uh, persuasion is one different business messages can be classified i've made an attempt to classify them persuasion persuasive messages or persuasive documents are resumes one you're trying to persuade somebody you're giving somebody information about yourself you're also trying to persuade them to see who you are and why you're applying for the position cover letter business proposals sales pitches and advertisements all constitute persuasive business documents direction could be orders policies rules and regulations um advice again directives could be letters could be memos could be informal communication giving information uh, reports memos notices circulars blogs quotations and other financial documents uh meeting minutes etc uh seeking information inquiries requests calls for explanation could be documents that seek information defending uh, could be your legal documents uh 
uh, and other documents that that discuss uh, defending your position acknowledgement and appreciation is another one where you sort of tell people you know awards and other things uh, idea generation idea generation acknowledgement and appreciation where you discuss rewards uh, idea generation is another one you know you sort of uh, use these messages to generate ideas in uh, businesses okay the writing process before you begin consider your task analyze do you plan to analyze classify compare contrast define describe discuss or survey something your purpose you explain uh, you want to explain something summarize persuade recommend entertain refute etc who is going to be reading your readership your rhetorical stance where are you talking as a an expert are you talking as a student are you talking as uh, somebody seeking information so where are you coming from genre and language and uh, specific online issues you know is it over email or whatever you first decide these things then you um, some elements of good writing given by john fielden in a paper published in 1964 readability is one the complexity abstractness sentence construction paragraph construction according to the reader's level the familiarity of words according to the reader's level sentence construction according to the familiarity of words intended direction for the reader and focus of the document so the document that you prepare should be readable check it against these different points correctness information you provide should be accurate grammar punctuation should be appropriate format should be the standard writing style appropriate for the document according to the company um, appearance should be what it is expected to be in that particular um, uh organization coherence is the relationship of ideas to each other logical juxtaposition of ideas to each other is is adds to the coherence um uh, thought is another one how much preparation has gone into it competence are you really qualified to write that document fidelity to document is your commitment to that document uh, it shows if you write the document with your whole heart into it uh it shows or if if it's just a passing document then it shows and it doesn't look very nice especially when you're trying to convince somebody analysis again depending on what you're writing thorough examination of data your ability to draw conclusions presentation of conclusions identification and justification of assumptions that you have made right in the beginning in preparing the document uh qualification of tenuous assertions again one example of this would be the the difference between transparency and uh, uh uh confidentiality and so where do you draw the line how much do you disclose how much do you not disclose and your biases do they reflect in the document or not so all of that is covered under analysis and it shows in the manner in which you analyze the information you are presenting uh clarity in writing uh tighten wordy sentences prefer active verbs balance parallel ideas add needed words eliminate confusing shifts from point of views from one point of view to the other uh, tense should be the same again you know all this is basic grammar i'm just sort of giving you a refresher here but all of these things add to the clarity of the document people complain that written documents lack clarity and you need to make sure that your document is as clear as possible uh, some tips on effective writing write with accuracy and precision um uh, be as clear as accurate as precise as possible avoid negative connotations that may be misleading to someone who's not familiar with the company or industry so as far as possible have as positive a spin on your written documents as possible uh, uh, know what you're writing about please make sure you know about the subject that is being being discussed otherwise prepare yourself uh, and then write the document avoid legal conclusions uh, written document is proof you don't want to leave any um, uh, any way for yourself or your organization to get into trouble so please do not make conclusions um, till you're sure of them especially in international business where interpretations can depend on the context the consequences can depend on the context all of this thing is contextual so please be very careful eliminate all inflammatory offensive or otherwise inappropriate language and the challenge is what will be considered inflammatory 
what will be considered offensive what will be considered inappropriate now i may crack a joke here but will it be considered appropriate maybe maybe not again you know in a class where i have students i can crack a joke and i can put in a disclaimer and they know that i don't really mean anything but i cannot do the same thing i cannot take the same liberty over uh, here i cannot be sarcastic about things i cannot use sarcasm to explain any concept in this video lecture similarly in written communication you don't have that benefit of of explaining things so please be careful define or clarify technical terms involving your work including specialized industry terms close the loop on all significant issues raised in writing the document uh, minimize off the cuff responses random responses you know just casual remarks should not be made control copy distribution big big thing please don't send things to people unless you really really mean to share them with everybody unless the people receiving these documents can make some use of them don't clog their inboxes don't clog their mailboxes don't do it be consistent in your documentation techniques why because you need to retrieve the document at a later date the whole purpose of keeping a written document is to be able to retrieve it so make sure that you document it appropriately give the file a name that you can remember uh precision clearly decide how can you bring precision into your writing clearly decide what you want to say right in the beginning regard your written communication as a conversation and lead the reader through different aspects of the uh, written document profile your reader and decide how you want the reader to react to what you write how do you want the reader what do you want the reader to do after they have read your document so have understand the concept context of the reader and try and also have it clear in your mind as to what you want them to do after they have received the document and read it consider what tone or attitude you want to take firm friendly humorous or apologetic open emphatically again make sure you get their uh, attention right in the beginning so that they are inclined to reading the document uh, use short sentences as far as possible uh, as short sentences as possible uh don't use big words that need to be looked up in a dictionary especially if you're using business if you're writing for business don't sag in the middle add reader incentive by conveying benefits for them you know give them some reason to keep reading your document and please don't give them long documents till you really need to organize your thoughts in chronological order uh and again you know whatever order there should be a logical order maybe chronology maybe something else explain what you want the reader to do and review your communications regularly and adapt to the situation uh some principles of effective business writing according to context specifically organize the content detail focus and reader direction according to the context adapt your style of writing to the preferences of the culture to which your readers belong so please be careful please adapt to the style please consider all of these specific challenges that we discussed in your writing and please make sure that you write things accordingly and don't expect non native users of the language you use for your documents to understand whatever you are talking about explain wherever possible and provide a translation in the reader's native language if and when possible but as far as possible keep your communication crisp to the point short use smaller words and you should be okay and again these are just tips you can you should take the leads from here and move on again some questions please discuss the differences between oral and written business communication what do you think makes writing effective describe the challenges to effectiveness in written communication especially in the written business environment uh sorry in the international business environment it shouldn't be written business environment it should be international business environment i'm sorry about that um uh, what are the skills you need to develop uh within your own self to deal with these challenges so please describe these challenges and and make a list of the skills that you need to develop to deal with all the challenges we have discussed so far and once you have made that list start plugging in the places that need to be plugged in and uh, you'll do really well thank you